Good evening. My name is Paul Newman, and I'm the president-elect of the Atmospheric Sciences section of the AGU. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce the 2020 Jewel Gregory Charney Lecture. This award is presented annually to a prominent scientist who has made exceptional contributions to the understanding of weather and climate. Professor Charney headed MIT's meteorology, meteorology department from 1974 to 1977. He joined the MIT faculty in 56 as a professor of meteorology and director of the Atmospheric and Ocean Dynamics Project. Charney was a driving force in meteorology, and it can be said that he's the father of numerical weather forecasting. Charney was awarded AGU's William Bowie Medal in 1976 because he, quote, guided the post-war evolution of modern meteorology more than any other living figure. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanna do some tracing. From 1948 to 1956, Charney was at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, where he headed the Meteorological Research Group. Charney invited Joe Smagorinsky to the Institute to study numerical weather prediction. Joe Smagorinsky said of Charney, quote, it is clear that the revolution he started has critically influenced virtually every aspect of meteorological and oceanographic science and its applications. In 1955, the General Cir Circulation Research sec Section was created under Smagorinsky, and it was moved to Princeton in 1963 and renamed the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, or GFDL, in 1963. And Smagorinsky was head of, of GFTL um, into the early 1980s. So this brings us to our Jewel Gregory Turney Lecture Award winner, the, dir the director of GFL, GFDL, excuse me, Ven Katachalam Ramaswamy, or as his friends know him, Ram. So Ram is a direct lineal descendant of Charney's work in Princeton, from Charney to Smagorinsky, and now to Ram. So a little bit about Ram. Ram received his Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of Delhi in 1975, followed by his Master's in Physics at the University of Delhi in 1977. Ram then got his PhD in Atmospheric Sciences at the State University of New York at Albany in 1982. He spent a couple of years in the Advanced Study Program at NCAR and then became a visiting scientist at GFDL in 1985. He was, on the research, he was a research scholar teacher staff at GFDL and he became a lecturer with the rank of professor at Princeton University. Ram joined GFDL as a civil servant in 1995, and he became the GFDL director in 2008. So Ram has a, a long list of awards that includes being a fellow of the AAAS, the AMS, and most particularly the American Geophysical Union. Ram has a long list of awards and these include the Distinguished Executive Presidential Rank Award, the Presidential Rank Award for Meritorious Senior Professionals, the NASA Henry J. E. Award, the NOAA Administrator, Administrators Award three times in 2008, 14, and 18. He's received the Department of Commerce Gold Medal in 2002 and 2007, and the Henry Houghton Award in 1994. Rom has, he's, he's no starter when giving these prestigious lectures. He's given the Walter Ors Roberts Lecture at the AMS. He's given the Joseph Priestley Society Lecture at the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia. He's given the Burt Bolin Lecture at Stockholm University. And he's given the Walter Orr Roberts Lecture at the Aspen Global Change Institute. Rom's publications, it's, it's a very, very long list. He has a very, very impressive Hirsch index of 71. Rom's science research has covered, you know, fundamental radiative transfer, radiative transfer, uh, radio forcing and climate change due to ozone, forcing and climate change due to aerosols, greenhouse gases, and clouds radiative signatures in the atmosphere, and aerosols versus greenhouse gas climate effects. Rom has been a lead author or a coordinating lead author in every IPC assessment since 1992. He's been a lead author, convening lead author on WMO ozone assessment reports from 91 to 2008 that feed into the Montreal Protocol. And he's been a convening lead author on the US Climate Change Science Program in 2006. So please follow me in welcoming Ram for his lecture today on aerosols and their gaming of the climate system Microscale presence to macroscopic impacts.
Good morning, good day, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be invited to present the Jules Chani lecture. And my thanks go to the committee, uh, Joyce Penner, Jim Hurrell, Paul Newman for uh, giving me this opportunity and the privilege to uh, remember Jul Charney and present this lecture at AGU 2020. The title of my talk is Aerosol Gaming of the Climate System, Microscale Presence to Macroscopic Impacts. First few words about Jul Charney. Um, Jul was a pioneer. Uh, he just did lots of things uh, that which we commemorate and are aware of uh, as uh, being the product of a visionary extraordinaire. Uh, he led the team that made the first numerical weather forecast on electronic computer, played a key role in helping establish the satellite observing system, and a very important uh, report that uh, he chaired uh, on carbon dioxide and climate, a scientific assessment, uh, the very first assessment of its kind in terms of the climatic impacts of carbon dioxide, and a very prescient one uh, in the sense that, uh, they, that that committee chaired by Charney anticipated so many issues that uh, we are still trying to come to grips with and quantify uh, today. I have a particular uh, fondness in uh, sort of recalling the uh, efforts that Charney made um, way back in the 50s. Uh, he was not only a, a theoretical scientist, a numerical modeler, but he also was very interested in advancing weather and climate prediction. And this is a photograph taken in the late 50s uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where Charney was engaged in uh, computations, uh, especially with von Neumann. And you see in the picture here, some of the very eminent scientists, uh, uh, Rosby, Bert Boleyn, and Joe Smagorinsky, who actually uh, became the first director of uh, GFDL. And Charney was very much responsible for enabling the founding of uh, GFDL, so a particular fondness uh, in terms of remembering uh, Jules Charney uh, at this occasion. The outline of my talk goes like this. Uh, I'm going to talk about greenhouse gases, aerosols, and radiative forcing, and in particular, the comparison between greenhouse gases and aerosols in terms of the thermod thermodynamics and dynamics involved in drumming circulation, um, and more particularly, talk in terms of the surface fluxes and hydrologic cycle, um, which kind of aerosols uh, have a very profound influence vis-a-vis uh, -vis greenhouse gases. I'm going to approach this from primarily the modeling side, but also combined with observations. And uh, in the process, going to discuss the three generations of models developed at GFDO, which have been used in CMIP and IPCC over the years. Uh, series 2 developed in 2004, Series 3 about 2011, and Series 4 in 2019. Most of the time, I am going to dwell on the Series 3. Uh, AM3 and CM3, atmospheric and climate models, respectively. So first, a few words on uh, the radiative forcing. Uh, you're all familiar with this uh, very uh, enchanting plot from IPCC assessment. This is a, happens to be from fifth assessment. And what I want to draw attention here is to this uh, conglomeration of well mixed greenhouse gases uh, led by CO2, all giving a positive forcing. They are on the right side of zero line. And then the aerosols, which uh, represent uh, a puzzle, uh, even up to today, because you can, if you see the arrows indicating the uncertainties, they are stretched uh, pretty far uh, compared to that for greenhouse gases. Uh, and then there is a direct effect of aerosols, uh, which is their effect in the clear portions of the sky. And then when they interact with the clouds, then you get sort of an even larger uncertainty. And then you see these different colors in the in the direct aerosol bar, and those represent the different aerosols. Um, and we'll be talking about a few of them, uh, sulfate, black carbon, nitrate, organic carbon, and mineral dust. So it's these two which kind of form the uh, principal uh, nexus of the uh, total anthropogenic forcing, which ends up being positive, but that uncertainty bar comes mainly from the aerosols. So the aerosols, present a uh, issue which has been longstanding and uh, in many ways still enigmatic. Now, the issue about aerosols, the uncertainty part of it is more stark when you look at a diagram like this, which is a probability density function of the effective rate of forcing. Greenhouse gases are in a sense, nice and simple. Uh, they are positive and they 
and they're very, very well defined positive, so you don't have any ambiguities about it. Whereas on the aerosol side, it's mostly negative because of the preponderance of the negative forcing by aerosols. But then it can also be slightly positive in terms of probability. That's because of the presence of absorbing uh, material in the aerosols. And so the, the, the sort of the, uns, the uncertainty extent is, re, is reflected by the width of the bar for the total anthropogenic, uh, which uh, is uh, much more than what greenhouse gases uh, themselves have. So there is sort of this high confidence that aerosols have offset a substantial portion of the forcing from the well-mixed greenhouse gases, but they contribute the largest to the uncertainty of the total RF. And we kind of dwell on these issues uh, as we go along. Now, in terms of the uh, evolution of the radiative forcing in the various IPCC assessments, 1990 through 2013, so that's from the first assessment to the fifth assessment, uh, for aerosol itself, if you notice a, a, a segregated according to the different species, uh, sulfate values have remained fairly stable, um, but the uncertainties kind of have, have increased, uh, have, inc have decreased, sorry, as we go from the second assessment to the fifth assessment. And then as you go black carbon, that's a little bit sort of all over the place. And uh, the uncertainty bars, it's positive, of course, but the uncertainty bars extend um, quite a bit now from the fifth assessment. And then you have biomass burning, um, you know, which is different from the sulfate and the black carbon, organic carbon, smaller, but uh, still uncertain, uh, dust, and then you have nitrate. And so that's kind of what reads the total forcing the, and the evolution is such that uh, the bars were, the uncertainty bars are given starting with the fourth assessment and you see so they're negative, but with a very large uncertainty. And wh why is that? So there are a lot of factors um, which gives rise to that spread of the uncertainty. Uh, one way to look at this is just the diversity of the sources. So in this diagram, the center is satellite observations and you see sort of this uh, big dust, uh, the, the dust or dust related effects uh, in the satellite record. And you also see other aerosols, but very, it's very heterogeneous. That's kind of one of the uh, differentiation points between the greenhouse gases and aerosols that uh, there is a lot of inhomogeneity. And then that is, Part, partly understood by two factors. One is the diversity of the sources. The other one is the short lifetime of the aerosol species. So the sources can be entirely anthropogenic as depicted here, this side, or they can be natural, which is sort of here, sea spray and volcanoes. Uh, but then you can have uh, some things which are sort of could be both natural and, and human influenced. And that is uh, dust from arid surfaces, and fires, uh, both natural and, and human influenced. And then you have secondary aerosol production uh, via ter terpenes and uh, other oxidation mechanisms uh, involving DMS. So that's the one thing, the sources are diverse and because of short lifetime, the inhomogeneity uh, reigns pretty strong. Um, the, the evolution of aerosol forcing knowledge has uh, been quite uh, steady starting from the 1990s, ever since uh, Charlson and Penner found radiative forcing for sulfate and uh, biomass burning. And then there have been refined models, uh, better models than the earlier ones. And then as we come into 2000s, GCM-based estimates, partly sub uh, supported by observations, uh, and then explicit treatment of aerosols with the improved observations, first generation models, second generation models coming into the 2010s, and then in the 20, 2020, um, you have new uh, studies uh, to determine sensitivity of aerosol uh, radiative and aerosol cloud interactions, both from models uh, and from observations. Quite a rich uh, array of studies going on. The microscopic uh, issue concerning aerosols is uh, depicted here in this plot, where uh, in the uh, Indo-X, in, in the Indian, Indian Ocean region, uh, the particulates collected uh, look like this north of ITCZ, and they are more sort of uh, pristine-ish uh, south of ITCZ, uh, almost pristine clouds here south of ITCZ, but uh, when you go Arabian Sea, uh, quite a thick haze. And, and so the, the particles themselves represent a, a, lot of, a lot of these particular mixtures of aerosols. And that microscale those microscale aspects touch upon the optics and the radiation uh, involved with aerosols. So that's sort of another 
complicating factor, quite unlike kind of what happens with greenhouse gases where uh, things are much more uh, simpler. Um, this is uh, probably one of the very first uh, um, compilations of the aerosol optical depth uh, done from satellite instruments and then complemented by ground-based measurements. And um, they, these observations reveal the presence of the aerosols, especially the very strong presence over continents, especially uh, Asia, uh, and also some over North America. And then this is of course, uh, winter time in Northern hemisphere. And then you see sort of the dust and also biomass plumes of uh, Africa. Um, and uh, th this uh, is all complemented with the ground-based measurements. So this has kind of provided some very strict constraints uh, which uh, models uh, had, to, had to obey. And in fact, the uh, first generation of models involving aerosol transport and forcing in an in a interactive sense uh, struggled, but then subsequently um, over the last 15 years, the situation has improved uh, quite a bit. Um, models now have to, uh, re models really have now a lot of observations to compare with, to, uh, uh, to calibrate against. And this is an example from the GFDL models uh, showing the um, result of comparison over different regions in the seasonal cycle. So the seasonal cycle is running in each sort of panel here. And it's the comparisons with Miser and Modis. Uh, Miser is dots, Modis is in circles. So you see kind of, this is the observation. And then the red line, uh, sorry, the black line is the model AM3, which was uh, circa 2011. And the red is uh, model, which is the most recent one, uh, 2019. And AM4, which is our fourth generation model, is seen to capture better uh, the uh, observations. And that's pro primarily because there's an improved, uh, not only observation, but also some improved understanding of the transport and transformation of aerosols. So you actually get a very nice result, both in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere and over practically all regions uh, with a pretty high correlation. Um, yeah, AM3 had a correlation overall of 0.85, whereas uh, the uh, <clears throat> the correlation of AM, in AM4 is 0.92. So we are making pretty good st strides and uh, achieving quite a lot in terms of comparison observations. And then this is another set of observations. Uh, this is over uh, China, uh, Global Energy Balance Archive, and AM3 and AM2 models being compared with the sort of decline that have, have appeared in the clear sky shortwave radiation flux and being captured by the model. Um, and then one of the things that uh, has happened is the emphasis on capturing the shortwave absorption by the atmosphere as uh, deduced from satellites. Um, and in AM3, we were about five watts per square meter uh, less than absorption. AM4 does much better, as you can see by the sort of almost white, whitishness all over the plot. And this gives the encouragement, that at least for the, the uh, present climate, we, we are capturing these things uh, to a degree of satisfaction that you need um, when you want to use models for uh, studies of changes uh, in aerosols. Um, one, one thing that uh, I want to kind of highlight from a past IPCC, this is the fourth assessment report. And for the first time, it, it, it did quantify from models that the sort of top of the atmosphere, total forcing and the surface forcing, the contrast. And so looking at the GFDL CM2 model, and it's kind of the same in the Miroc model back then, you see the top of the atmosphere are pretty much red, which means mostly dominated by greenhouse gas forcing, punctuated by some blues where the aerosols are poking at it, poking at it and uh, giving a negative forcing. But the surface is so different. It's a very strong negative forcing all in all, almost all across the Northern Hemisphere, where the, there's a lot of emissions in contrast to Southern Hemisphere. And this, uh, I want to point out, you, because later on, we're going to sort of talk about this uh, intrahemispheric asymmetry um, that, that occurs in the forcing between the Northern and Southern hemisphere. And it, it's kind of appears in all the models um, uh, with the, with the, because they have the aerosol emissions primarily in the Northern hemisphere. So let me get directly go to the radiative perturbations and precipitation response. And here I want to touch um, to Chani's work um, which kind of motivated actually this particular preparation of this particular talk. Um, Charney back in the mid seventies uh, thought a lot about the Sahel drought. Um, and 
he, he had this question that seeing that uh, the the uh, desert areas uh, in Africa are a, a net relative sink, um, he was wondering whether albedo feedback, uh, because basically a semi-aridity causing the changeover from going to, from a little bit of arid to more arid conditions causes an increase in albedo. And does that feedback cause an increased desertification? And Charney first looked at this with very simple models. Uh, he actually got motivated by looking at the um, the uh, the, re the record of the from from the early satellites of the radiation energy over the deserts, and speculated that because of the because of this ha happens just sort of uh, in the northern part of the of the sort of equatorial region, that whether the uh, natural subsidence that occurs is going to be further amplified, causing an increased desertification. And this was a, he did it illustrating a simple model, but then he actually then went uh, and uh, used the NASA GIST GCM, one of the earliest GCMs, uh, and published his paper in the Quarterly Journal in 1975, uh, showing very clearly that as you increase the albedo uh, from 14% to 35%, you actually got a decrease in precipitation not only that, he actually also saw that uh, you did move the, uh, with the increase in albedo, uh, you kind of uh, moved the uh, precipitation away from uh, the re region where it is to slightly southward. And this was further amplified uh, in studies later on done with different GCMs, uh, uh, which uh, illustrated this particular, that the basic physics that Chardney had uh, speculated on uh, really were bearing through in the uh, general situation models. And that's what then motivated this uh, study that uh, we did in um, did in back in the uh, uh, mid 90s, where supposing you cook up an experiment where the greenhouse gas and the albedo forcing are the same global be in the global bean, but you let the greenhouse gas forcing be kind of whatever it was, I think it was two point half watts per square meter. And but the albedo forcing is, was uh, cooked up by tuning the albedo of clouds. Like this was a model with fixed clouds. But you cooked up the albedo only in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I think it was uh, 30 to 60 knot. And you let it have a uh, forcing, which in the global mean works out to cancel the CO2 forcing. So, which means that the global mean forcing is zero. So, you know, what you'd expect is, this is sort of in, in the surface temperature response, the zonal mean, this is what you get for the greenhouse gases with a slight amplification in the polar regions. Uh, the, al the albedo forcing sort of gives you a strong negative in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's because uh, of, the, of the cooling that you get. But what is interesting is when you look at the precipitation response, you actually see what, uh, what Chardney had uh, suggested that about the albedo changes. The greenhouse gas response is you know, pretty tepid, uh, which is well known from uh, theoretical studies and, and even numerical, early numerical modeling studies done by Manavi uh, and colleagues. But the albedo change gives you this uh, very sharp decrease where the aerosols were inserted just sort of uh, north of the uh, equator and south of the equator, you get the increase. And because the meridional uh, circulation changes and the energy that has to be transported uh, between the northern and southern hemisphere. So this interhemispheric asymmetry creates this sort of a dipole effect where you get a decrease in the northern hemisphere and an increase southern hemisphere just uh, around the equator, equatorial regions. This was uh, borne out later on by this study uh, where uh, it was a different GCM, but the same thing, you know, for the greenhouse gas, you get sort of the effect here, a uh, very classic effect from, with a mixed layer model. Whereas for the albedo, you get this uh, aerosol change, you get this. This was a more realistic aerosol forcing than before. And then the combined effect is also mimicking the aerosol effect, namely a decrease south of the equator and increase, uh, sorry, a decrease just north of the equator and increase south of the equator. And this is being shown now in, in several studies. And I'm gonna to go to the um, uh, AM3, CM, uh, CM3, the atmospheric model and climate model of the third generation, where now this is a full GCM with interactive transport of aerosols and the aerosols interact both direct radiation, they get, in, they get in, included in clouds and uh, have the aerosol cloud uh, indirect effect as well. Uh, and of course, uh, one thing I have to quickly say is this is of course a very super complex puzzle, puzzle because of the involvement of aerosols and clouds is just running through a gamut of physical processes which are not yet fully quantified to a degree that one can call satisfactory. 
although there are some qualitative glimpses that are emerging, which are probably uh, much better in clarity than before. And a lot of studies have gone on uh, to elucidate and quantify using models. Uh, the, I'm gonna now uh, look at the, um, the forcing and response in the uh, GFTL models. So first of all, in the latest model, which is AM4, uh, you see the aerosol forcing at the top of the atmosphere uh, being sort of slightly negative, but the surface forcing is much stronger, just like before. So these things change quantitatively, model to model, but the, the signatures and the effects and the sort of dichotomy between the top of the atmosphere and surface remains virtually the same in all models. And just later on, we'll kind of go over this uh, because it differentiates some of these models. Is AM3, the third generation had the strongest forcing uh, because of the strong aerosol indirect effect. Uh, AM2 had no indirect effect, so it was pretty small aerosol rate of forcing. And AM4 was sort of in between where this effect was moderated to yield a lesser forcing. So AM2 had no aerosol core interactions, AM3 had strong aerosol core interactions, and AM4 has moderate aerosol core interactions. One thing to remember as we go along here is uh, this kind of picture of the Earth's energy balance. In the surface flux balance, um, you got sort of a net short wave coming of 168 watts per square meter. The long wave net is 66 watts per square meter. So latent heat and sensible heat have make up that balance in the global mean. Uh, and uh, the latent heat to sensible heat uh, is approximately three, three times. So latent heat is actually, the, in the global mean sense, the more dominant uh, 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 effect of the non-relative influences in the energy balance. So in terms of, uh, I'm gonna focus now a lot on the AM3 model, which uh, you have to bear in mind had the strongest uh, uh, aerosol cloud interaction enforcing. So if you look at just this, bo this box here, the, air, the greenhouse gas effect is very strong. The aerosol effect cancels about uh, one third of that warming uh, so that the net forcing is somewhat resembling the, um, the observation. And I have to mention these are three ensemble members. Those are the, the cross you see. So I'm gonna focus more on the precipitation change. And this is the annual mean precipitation change in this model. And you see the, uh, in the global mean, again, we may we wanna to choose to focus just on that. The all forcing is the effect is the sort of result of a cancellation almost of the well mixed greenhouse gas and aerosol effect. And note that even though the temperature effect was only one third offset by aerosol, in terms of precipitation, the aerosol more than offsets the greenhouse gas forcing. And to kind of understand this, one can look at the surface flux change. And before I go to the all force, just look at the well mixed greenhouse gas. So there's an increase in long wave at the surface in the well mixed greenhouse gas cases because you have, uh, you have the CO2 increase, you have the other greenhouse gas increase, but you also have the water vapor increase in response to the uh, warming. And so there's a sharp long wave increase at the surface. The latent heat has to increase. So the surface loses latent heat and that's kind of what causes increased pre uh, precipitation in the CO2 case. In the aerosol only case, you have the uh, net short wave decreasing because of the aerosol. And that has to be made up again by latent heat, mostly. And the latent heat now means that less heat is exported from the surface or so the surface actually gains latent heat. And these effects are very well seen in the all forcing, almost sort of a, a, a summation of the two effects separately. So the net short wave is decreasing because of the aerosols, the long wave is increasing because of greenhouse gases. And so the latent heat is actually a small residual between what you would get for well mixed greenhouse gases and aerosols. Um, and this in fact uh, is, uh, is, is sort of a mechanism which accompanies this, uh, uh, this uh, explanation of the observed decrease in rainfall over South Asia, particularly this Indo-Gangetic plain in the late 20th century, where uh, you see the effect of the precipitation trend. The black line is the observations. You see a decreasing trend uh, and but and but with greenhouse gas alone would actually give you an increase. So the only way you can explain it in in terms of the trend, despite the noisiness in the in the observation and the model, is that you have to invoke aerosol, tropospheric aerosol, and actually it turns out that you have to invoke a little bit of the natural uh, volcanic aerosol as well. But together they give you an explanation where the, whereas the greenhouse gas only increase will not uh, give you an expression of this long-term trend over the 50-year period. 
And one thing to quickly add is that the, in the case of the Indian monsoon, uh, the local aerosols are important throughout the entire monsoon season uh, with only the, towards the end of the monsoon season that remote aerosols uh, start contributing uh, to the drying. Uh, and this has been seen other studies. In fact, this uh, study by Chung and Ramanathan documents the, uh, the shift in rainfall uh, in, all, in major areas of, uh, of the world, uh, weakening Indian monsoon and also over the rest of Asia. And uh, they also comment on the Sahelian drought. So the explanation for this uh, is, uh, is because of the north-south asymmetry that the anthropogenic aerosols include. So if you picture in a, in a very broad sense, the Hadley cell and the Walker cell, which is how the climatology, in the gas only case, Wellman's greenhouse gas and ozone changes case, uh, you actually have uh, Walker circulation, which is weakened. Uh, you don't have any major effects on the, on the, uh, on, on, on sort of the Hadley cell uh, compared to the aerosol, where because of this north-south gradient, you actually in, uh, weaken the meridional circulation, which is kind of very similar, although the, the flavor is slightly different, it is quite similar to the Charney argument and also the studies that followed that uh, using different uh, shades of GCMs. So, uh, you, so you have this strong meek weakening of the meridional circulation. You also have a little bit of strengthening of the Walker circulation due to the aerosols, but then when you combine the two, you get this combined effect where you have both the Walker cell uh, Walker circulation weakening as well as the meridional circulation uh, being weakened. Um, and this uh, effect is actually seen uh, in the same of five models. Some of the models, at least, they see this decrease in precipitation and they also see the dominance of the shortwave flux in reducing the vigor of the hydrologic cycle. So there is actually less precipitation in this model in the, in the sort of all force experiments. Whereas if they run the experiment with greenhouse gas only, you see sort of a uniform increase in the precipitation, which is expected from uh, now several modeling studies uh, going back uh, almost uh, 70 years. Okay, so what about the observations? So in the observations, um, I'll just sort of focus on the black line here. This was from IPCC AR4 actually. And you see sort of this, uh, uh, this uh, indication of a decrease in Northern hemisphere, uh, just north of the equator and an increase to the South of the equator. Um, then, and that's very, in, interesting because uh, the models with strong aerosol uh, north-south asymmetry do actually produce that. Um, th then there's sort of a study of the northern hemisphere reduction in precipitation and there are a lot of lines here, but I'll just point out to the, so if you follow the black line here, that's sort of ob observation and showing sort of the decrease over this period, 1960 to 1990. And this is now uh, several different models and the model mean kind of shows uh, a decrease over the same period. Um, and and uh, the, this paper actually also plotted the Northern Hemisphere sulfate loading showing how the sulfate loading actually is, uh, or rather the precipitation is uh, decreases following the increase in sulfur loading and then seems to tape, seems to sort of go back to more normal conditions as the sulfur loading in the Northern Hemisphere seems to be tapering off. Um, let me go back to now an earlier model because that had only the direct aerosol effect and kind of uh, presents an interesting comparison. So first of all, uh, one has to remember that the sulfate and black carbon and both of them peak in the Northern hemisphere. They don't, they, they kind of fall off in, as you go away from the equatorial regions. And one thing about uh, black carbon and sulfate is they are so much mirror of each other. That is, and in more generally, I think we can speak of absorbing and scattering aerosols. They are so much of a mirror of each other. So this is a result of an atmospheric uh, model experiment forced by observed SSTs, where you perturb uh, the, the world by changing single scattering albedo. So that's an indicator of absorption. And it and doesn't matter which region you choose, but the mid-level and the low-level clouds, you can see on this panel here, um, as you go towards from, uh, high absorption to low absorption, you see sort of a reversal of the changes in cloudiness. And in this diagram, you also see changes in the vertical velocity uh, directly con uh, connected to the, uh, the, the degree of scattering and absorption. So pretty, very well mirror image of each other. And this is kind of reflected then in their effects on circulation. So if you look at this curve, these two curves, black carbon and sulfate, uh, the black lines are the precip. So as for sulfate, the scattering aerosol, um, you have the decrease 
in the northern part, northern equatorial parts and the decrease in southern equatorial parts. Black carbon just flips it. It's exactly the other way around. And you also see the vertical velocity here. It's a decrease. Here it's increased. And flat black carbon, it's all the other way around. And when you combine the two, what is happening is that the, that the black carbon and sulfate, at least in the context of this model and how it was specified, is trying to cancel off, the, uh, is going to offset the effect of either one of them. And they are in contrast to the well-mixed uh, greenhouse gas signal, which kind of peaks in the tropics. So the effects on the circulation are quite vivid for whether it's scattering or absorbing aerosol, excepting that the signatures are, 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 are flipped in terms of the sign. Now in CM 2.1, which had only the direct aerosol effect, you kind of see roughly the same physics in terms of the precipitation change. Uh, Well-mixed greenhouse gas tends to increase it, aerosols tend to decrease it. And again, you see sort of an apparent cancellation, even though this kind of model had no indirect effect. And again, Asia, uh, you know, so she sees the largest effect. And if you look at the surface flux change, same thing, a well-mixed greenhouse gas has an increase in long wave, compensated by the latent heat decrease at the surface. Aerosol, just the opposite, net short wave is decreased and you have latent heat uh, increasing. That is, a sub, uh, sorry, the surface is uh, gaining latent heat. Um, so, you know, one, one can speculate, uh, it's always uh, tempting to speculate, although it's uh, fraught with uh, trouble later on, but I'll uh, sort of say this anyway. Well-mixed greenhouse gas increasing in the 21st century, aerosol is gonna decrease. Uh, now, when these happen or when they kind of, when the aerosol actually decrease uh, happens globally is still a matter of debate. But if these two things happen, then just the physics of the effects should tend, should lead you to believe that it has to be a reversal of what happened in the 20th century. And indeed, we kind of see that. If you look at this diagram, this is from CM3, um, the greenhouse gas only simulation would tend to increase precipitation on this trajectory. Aerosol has decreased it. And so the all forcing has more or less followed the aerosol curve uh, with the aerosol maybe affects greater than or equal to or greater than greenhouse gases over this whole period. But then as the 21st century scenarios take hold, are we going to see something like this with an increase in precipitation uh, because now there is uh, no aerosol in, uh, uh, there anymore. And that was from CM3. I can sort of look at CM4 and the same thing is evident in CM4 as well, even though it had a lesser uh, indirect forcing. So forcing alone, you know, is not gonna be, um, the, the differences in forcing are not necessarily affecting the qualitative pattern of the sort of decrease over this period and then the increase. Uh, in this case, CM4 is the uh, dotted curve, the global mean, and the, uh, the, um, the solid curve is uh, CM3. So again, you can uh, look at in terms of the changes in surface flux. This is related to 2000. So you look at 2100 minus 2000. Now the short wave has increased related to 2000 because aerosols have gone off. Long wave has increased further because of increase in greenhouse gases. And the latent heat now is a bigger component because now you have these two effects adding the same direction, which as you can imagine leads to increased precipitation globally. And in parts of the world where precipitation um, is, uh, where precipitation does happen now, it's gonna increase even more. So let me come to the concluding points here of this uh, talk. The diversity of aerosols and effects um, varies a lot uh, depending, on the, depending on the character of the aerosol, depending on where they are. And this has effects on not just radiation, but also in turn uh, on circulation and precipitation. The 20th century anthropogenic aerosol influence on precipitation has likely offset a lot of the greenhouse gas, so, uh, has offset a lot of the greenhouse gas effect. And it's in fact more than how it has offset the greenhouse gas surface temperature effect. Surface temperature effect tends to be only one third, uh, at least the models that uh, I've described Whereas in the case of precipitation, it almost seems like a complete offset. And the mechanisms due to aerosols, which start with the relative, uh, as relative forcing asymmetry between Northern and Southern hemisphere, affects surface fluxes, the meridional circulation, and thus the hydraulic cycle in both the North and Southern equatorial parts. Uh, there is non-linearity. The whole solution sh shifts to the aerosol solution in terms of the shift of the ITCZ. The aerosol effect of the observed Indian monsoon rainfall uh, does make for a physical consistency, even though quantitatively 
there are other effects that had to be considered, including uh, a lot of internal variability. One thing uh, in sort of a, almost, uh, you know, a, uh, in, a, in a wistful sense is that quantitative gaps continue to inhibit a complete understanding of the 20th century aerosol effects. Models uh, predict uh, a, a very, a, a sort of a, um, a big effect, but we don't have, we, we haven't had enough observations to really constrain all parameters over the last part of the 20th century. Um, and, and so um, it's uh, very difficult to actually, uh, it probably will be difficult to complete the quantitative gaps completely. And 21st century will be very intriguing. Uh, can, would we have a reversal of the 20th century effects with the expected aerosol drawdown and greenhouse gas increase or are there gonna be other factors uh, that come into play? And I just mentioned land use changes also coming into play, especially as we once talked about regional precipitation. All right, complexities. The, 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 the research would not be complete without talking about complexities. One is the entire, the uh, microphysical parameters that shape the aerosol cloud interactions. And this is a study which uh, was uh, done um, using a GFDL model by Chris Golas, where uh, com if you compare the 20th century temperature change, and now you force alternate configurations with plausible but different microphysical parameter choices, so CM3 was the official model and that's in uh, green here. And then the red and blue are the alternate choices. You see that they're quite different in trying to fit the 20th century temperature change. But then if you look at the, uh, the uh, A-train observations of the microphysical fingerprint, namely the transition from non-precipitation to precipitation in the real atmosphere, then you see a different picture. CM3, which is all the standard model is well, okay, approximately doing a reasonable job, but not really a very satisfactory one. And then the model that um, actually uh, did the best in 20th century has the, is the poorest in terms of the process level comparison, whereas the model that did not do 20th century at all well, it was the worst of all these three models, actually does well at the process level, but not in the representation of 20th century. So this is a dilemma. How do we, um, how do we get around it? Um, and so there are a lot of a uh, lot of issues involved, and I'll just sort of uh, go over uh, some of them. Uh, one issue is involving the uh, the dust uh, aerosol. In fact, I have not talked about dust aerosols throughout, and that's something that's been neglected. I mean, dust is the most ubiquitous aerosol in the atmosphere on this planet, and we have really paid attention a lot to the anthropogenic uh, sulfate and the anthropogenic uh, black carbon. And dust is very is copious. And so what does it do in the atmosphere? How does it interact with clouds, for example? Does it have an effect on the, on the, in, uh, on the indirect interactions? And shown here is uh, actually a picture where from the model, from the AM4 model, where the dust is interacting strongly with clouds. How, do the, how does that interaction take place? Does it have any downstream effects uh, as the as sort of air goes to the, uh, from the Af Africas at across the Atlantic to the Americas. Does it have any effect on the clouds circulation and uh, even severe storms? And then there is this very confounding thing about ice itself. So clouds themselves are pretty complicated. Uh, life becomes even more tough when you talk about ice nucleation and uh, dust is of course involved to some degree in that, but there's also other uh, aerosols involved. And how does this whole interaction across these, uh, across the atmosphere in regions to the whole world uh, take place when you consider all these different aerosols. And so finally, I, I'll end up with a suggestion really. Uh, we have a lot of phenomena that we are having even now, uh, like, uh, you know, almost on a sort of a, uh, a daily monthly basis, uh, aerosols, ozone air quality, wildfires and affecting air, air atmospheric composition. And the dust event, uh, which occurred across, um, in terms of the lofting of dust and flowing across the continents. And then uh, finally, we have, of course, a natural thing, volcanic eruptions, where we haven't had the benefit of a volcano in uh, three decades. Um, is it about time that such a thing happens? My purpose in introducing these is that one maybe can go to an improved understanding by going to uh, events which are not necessarily uh, on, events which are not necessarily climatic in shape, such as looking at trends in climate, but actually uh, are looking at short time scales, only as a means to kind of test the processes 
that are proving so important on the climate time scale. So essentially taking the events and processes happening on a short time scale and seeing if the models of our, if our present climate models can actually do a better understanding of those. So that would be something that um, I'm personally looking forward to in terms of the weather to climate time scale interpretation of processes and events and phenomena. Finally, let me turn to Jules Charney, who's so much of a pioneer in many ways, um, and basically uh, set, the, set in motion the very uh, uh, advanced studies leading to practical outcomes in terms of the understanding the behavior of the atmosphere and its prediction. But I want to quote here, I want to borrow a quote here from Joe Pedlowski, uh, given at the centenary celebration of Ed Lorenz and Jules Charney about the other contributions that uh, Jules made uh, generosity of spirit, advancing collaborative collegiality, and very importantly, setting a standard for personal and scientific integrity that is of exceptional importance. And he becomes a role model, uh, having practiced that uh, throughout his life. Finally, um, I will uh, list your acknowledgments. Uh, I, am, I acknowledge the entire GFTL staff, past and present, uh, including graduate students, postdocs, and visiting scientists. Uh, and in particular, uh, the list goes on here. Uh, 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 and then uh, both from GFTL, uh, Massimo Bolasina, Chen, Friedenreich, Genu, Horowitz, uh, Ming, Ako, Painter, Prasad, Randalls, and Schwarzkopf. And additionally, I want to acknowledge uh, Ramanathan from Scripps and Greg Frost from Noah Ezreal, all of them for sharing with me generously their ideas and uh, their sort of intellectual viewpoints and also allowing me to bounce off uh, ideas of, of my own um, and getting feedbacks from them. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ram. Thank you. So we have a few questions for you, Ram. Um, okay. and we have about, uh, 10, 10, 10, 13 minutes or so. Okay. So let me start off with a, a question from, uh, Cynthia Randalls, uh, space-based observations of AOD have helped models to reduce uncertainty and direct aerosol radiative forcing, but uncertainty remains, especially due to atmospheric absorption. How can we now reduce this uncertainty given the difficulty in observing absorption by aerosol at a global scale? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Paul and Jim, for uh, saying nice things and uh, allowing me this opportunity. And uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to give this lecture. Um, so, uh, am I, can, I, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear? Okay. Thank you. So to Cynthia's question, well, thank you for that question, Cynthia. Um, yeah. yeah, it is a very important component that we still have quantitative gaps on. Uh, probably it's 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 as important as uh, even the aerosol liquid cloud uh, interactions. Um, and one of the things is that you know particles are getting mixed in the atmosphere. <laughs> And uh, it's not, you know, an absorbing particle, a particle that's absorbing contains so many other components uh, that trying to, I, I'm speaking from the modeling side and trying to capture them, it is difficult to uh, get a handle on them microscopically as well as hygroscopically and optically. So we have to rely on observations. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on observations, but I think, uh, one way is uh, probably trying multispectral measurements. But I think more importantly, this problem regarding uh, absorbing aerosols and the degree of absorption an aerosol exerts is probably going to be con constrained and, uh, you know, uh, and the, ga the gap in quantification be narrowed, mainly probably through process studies. I mean, definitely, I think, uh, space-based observations are going to be very, very helpful because they are the only ones that can get us globally. But I think it's going to be important to uh, really have some uh, field campaigns uh, or process study campaigns where, if it's possible, measure really all the parameters 
that are necessary for a closure problem. Uh, that's usually very difficult, but I think if we can do that, uh, we might have a handle on the degree of absorption uh, that's happening. I mean, as, as you could tell, I mean, one of the plots that I had was the short wave absorption in the atmosphere, and we still think there are missing elements uh, in terms of the aerosol component that is actually skewing our results on atmospheric absorption. And one of the things is the atmospheric absorption is so very important uh, in terms of the precipitation because the absorption in the atmosphere is has a direct uh, governing factor. It's a direct governing factor into precipitation. So, so this is an important component. I I'm not sure that uh, I can tell you a lot about you know how to conduct expert observations. But uh, all I can say is that you know the the more we bring in the optics and the microphysics uh, measurements together, uh, the better ch the better the chance we have towards nailing this problem. It remains an important problem. Okay, thanks. Um, another question from uh, Deep T Singh: On what time scales would you expect the reversal of the twentieth century trends to occur? if we aggressively try to reduce anthropogenic aerosols? And what implications should we consider from this reversal for climate adaption efforts? So I guess, uh, thank you, Deepthi. I guess by reversal, you're meaning the reversal of the last half of the 20th century. In a sense, I think, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that's difficult is, of course, the uh, comparison with observations uh, of, of the observed trends. Uh, I mean, aerosols have been like these uh, characters where uh, here you see them, the next moment you're gone because they are actually going away from the atmosphere. And, and you know, to the extent that the observations of precipitation, um, if they are indeed suggesting a reversal, uh, that's already starting to happen. Uh, if, whether it's due to aerosols or not is another question. but. Supposing it is due to aerosols, then one has to say it's already beginning to happen. Uh, it actually started to begin, started to happen probably around the end of 1990s and into 2000s. So that trend due to the anthropogenic aerosol as we know it has already started to happen. But then, you know, you have to be cautious that uh, interpretation of uh, precipitation trends entirely in terms of anthropogenic aerosols perhaps would be a mistake. Uh, it might have been a major contributing factor, but there may be other factors. But if you if you, if you sort of take the, the take the limit that they were all due to anthropogenic aerosols, that trend has already started to reverse. Uh, and when when would it would be a, like a complete reversal? I think that's going to depend upon how fast the greenhouse gas forcing is going to go up, because uh, you know it should it, it, again you know again so you have to. Constraining the, again, simplifying the problem to just greenhouse gas and aerosol. The greenhouse gas increase is going to certainly soon uh, override the effect any aerosol would do, at least in terms of global mean precipitation. I mean, regionally, it, might, it may be a different story altogether. Um, what implications should we consider for climate adaptation efforts? Um, I, I think, again, you know, uh, in the global, in the global mean sense, uh, I think uh, you may want to start seeing the signatures already there in terms of reversal of the effect. But again, I think you know precipitation is such a heterogeneous quantity that you have to go to regional regional stuff. And in regional, in the regional information case, you have you know Asia is going to be stuff. Asia is going to see the biggest reversal. So wherever you know it was like drying or reducing reduced in precipitation is going to see a big increase uh, if again if again the physics that we are talking about is the only physics happening then you are going to see the most increase in precip probably occurring in asia relative to the 1970s okay um Here's another question from uh, Shantao Liu. Can you comment on the aerosol impact on the severe weather, such as invigoration of intense convection proposed by Daniel Rosenfield? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. I think this was an effect that I did not talk about, uh, but it's a very relevant one, particularly, uh, I think it connects to one of the slides I showed at the end about ice clouds. Uh, and this kind of goes directly into Danny's uh, hypothesis and in, indeed the uh, process observations that he has made. Uh, I think the uh, aerosol impact uh, in terms of the invigoration is certainly a, a real thing and is happening. And it actually contributes probably a lot to the severe weather part, more so than you know anything happening just with pure liquid water. Because of the fact that uh, the invigoration process, of course, works that uh, you know you suppress the uh, suppress the rain, and then the, as the updrafts keep going up, now you don't get water, you get ice, and maybe even hail and other forms of frozen hydrometeors. So it it becomes very severe, um, and you know the, the couple of factors there are uh, just the occurrence of uh, you know these convective cells. Uh, how are they changing in character as, as the climate is changing? And there certainly is some uh, evidence that it is. So that's one thing that I think we'll have to think more about, the frequency of uh, convective storms. And the other thing that one has to see, and it goes back to the microphysics, is the kind of aerosols uh, that we have and that can um, d do this nucleation and then uh, actually also are, uh, can form these uh, ice hydrometeors. Uh, what do we know about them? Do we have enough quantitative information about them? And I think there is certainly some work to be done on the kind of nuclei that are available for ice formation. And so together, the macro scale, the, the mesoscale, sorry, and the micro scale are going to be both important in terms of this. So, so it's an effect that is a little bit different than what I talked about because I was focusing on the more large scale effects and uh, much more sort of zonal mean kind of effects. But this effect uh, in a local sense, in a regional sense, is going to be particularly important. Thanks. OK, a question from uh, Ralph Kahn. Um, he, first, first of all, compliments you. Nice talk, Ram. You made a point of the constraints satellite AOD makes to constraining models. I'm wondering how big an issue is the lack of information about species specific mass extinction efficiency and aerosol hygroscopicity. Models assume a huge range of values for these quantities, yet they are critical for interpreting ambient AOD in terms of model based aerosol mass. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. Uh, you 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 have a real kicker there. I mean, it is a it is a tough uh, question. Um, uh, models do assume uh, things which are very general. Uh, they have to because you know they can get overly complicated uh, too soon, too fast. Because uh, then you may be going off the wrong end. But that doesn't obviate the fact that we do need this uh, very specific information about uh, species, their optics, and their hygroscopic properties. Um, it's, uh, you know, what I would say is that uh, besides all these observations, the satellite observations, the ground-based observations, they are offering a lot of constraints. But I think in the case of species-specific things, uh, we may be missing out some things which are very important uh, uh, regionally in terms of uh, when the precipitation occurs, uh, what is the severity? What's the duration? Those kind of questions, I think, uh, obviously, large scale has a lot to do with it. But still, I think there are um, there are things concerning, you know, if a cloud is going to rain, for example. I mean, that might start to depend upon some very microphysical aspects, which we are unable to handle in the models. Um, how? So yeah, I mean, the, no, no, no question. It is important, and models typically have to kind of rely on observations to be able to anchor to something. And you don't have observations everywhere around the world. And yet the models have to do the whole world. So, you know, if you go to, for example, uh, more, I mean, you have observations more commonly over routes that are often traveled by ships uh, and where human beings go there all the time. So you, you get a lot of, you have a chance for observations there, but you don't have a chance for observations in the really uh, you know, isolated areas which are likely more pristine. And so what, uh, I mean, so I'm kind of rambling here, but what needs to happen is actually a way to get at these things 
from all from different parts of the globe, different maybe uh, weather regimes, uh, different cloud regimes, so that we can actually piece together some picture from which we can uh, draw upon and uh, a picture that is robust, and then draw upon that to construct the model. So it's a problem. It, you know, we haven't resolved it, and it does affect probably some of the solutions. It probably does affect some of the uncertainties that we draw upon that we draw upon solutions. So it is something just like in the case of the you know absorbing component of aerosols. This is another one of those microphysics thing that uh, we need to get a handle on through uh, measurements, extensive measurements globally. Thanks, Ralph. Okay, uh, we're kind of, we're running out of time here, but I'm going to have one more question. I apologize. There's a few more questions here, but I'll give. Lavendra Dubey, the, the final word. First of all, he says, hello. Um, both precipitation and warming are significant for impacts in greenhouse gases and aerosols uh, gave different impacts. Given this known complexity, what are your views of cloud brightening and stratospheric aerosol geoengineering to cool and likely dry the climate in the hypothetical future? So a, a geoengineering question is a final here, Ram. Yeah, thanks, Dubey. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, um, you know, I think one of the things about, uh, I'll just sort of contrast precipitation with temperature first. Uh, you know, temperature is a much more homogeneous variable. And even though it has been very difficult to attribute temperature changes, yet systematically that's been done over, you know, 20 years, 25 years, has been done and brought to a point of satisfaction. Precipitation has been difficult, you know, in terms of doing <clears throat> attribution, but we are, we are starting to get there. There's already starting to, you know, be identified the circulation regimes connected with precipitation. And therefore, uh, you, you can actually start talking not just about precipitation, but also the circulation regime that accompanies it. And there, therein, you can establish a pattern to, you know, do a physical uh, link between the two. Um, so now, you know, in terms of... Uh, the complexity, I mean, knowing the complexity, uh, geoengineering, the two things you mentioned, cloud brightening and stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. I mean, I think that there have been a lot of studies, obviously, of, uh, you know, done with models, and they do indicate the same physical process happening. That is, if you have aerosols in the, in the atmosphere, you are going to cause changes in precipitation patterns. Now, it actually depends on, you know, where the aerosols are. I mean, volcanoes give us some clue as to that. If it's only symmetric around the equator, I mean, sorry, if it's symmetric around the equator, it's one effect, if, but if the same amount of aerosol was in northern hemisphere only, it's another effect. If it was in the southern hemisphere only, it's another effect. So where do you put these aerosols, uh, given just the physics that we understand so far, you do have an idea of, uh, you know, what would happen to stratospheric aerosols. Cloud brightening, a little bit, met, a little, I mean, uh, more studies have to be done, have to be done about cloud brightening because in terms of impacts uh, on downstream variables like precipitation, like circulation, I mean, what, what does it actually do? I think they, they, there aren't as many studies, I would think, in their, that field as much as there are in the stratospheric aerosol uh, geoengineering field. But in both cases, you have to examine what's going to happen to the circulation. It's not just temperature, not just precipitation. It's really the whole picture. You know, what is the big picture? And, you know, does, does the sort of a, some kind of, a, you know, a tr triggering of a geoengineering event in some place, does it have the propensity to start doing large scale uh, meridional zonal perturbations? I think that still is something that uh, needs, has to be further investigated and models are actually set up to do that, to explore, to explore and probe those questions now very well. Okay, so for everybody, uh, it's it's been a real pleasure and, and an honor to for you to give this lecture today. Thank you, Ram, and uh, applause from the entire group. So thank you, everybody. Have a good evening or a good morning, as the case may be. Thank you very thank much. You very much and Paul. Have a good night. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Good night.